Hi, everyone. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley, and if Seth and I sound different, you know why. We cannot get to our studio. So hello from my home, where I swear that I'm not wearing daytime pajamas. And now you're listening to the acoustics of my den. Molly and I have decided to practice some extra safe social distancing and keep not six feet, but 60 miles apart. Our producers, Gary Niederhoff and Sarah Derwin, are similarly distant, and by that I don't mean that they're aloof, but we are all still here, creatively, if not physically, and committed to putting out new episodes of Big Picture Science for you as best we can, when we can, and getting innovative if we have to, which we've already begun to do, as you're about to hear. We are committed to staying nimble in this changing situation. You know, it's amazing that our extreme behavioral response has been prompted by a bit of biology that's a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. As this global crisis unfolds, we are going to learn a lot about how the virus operates, as well as have new insights about ourselves and what really matters. There is still a lot of uncertainty, we know. But everyone who works on the show is certain about one thing. Science is going to help us get through this crisis. This episode explores that theme, follow the science, or rather, why we didn't. We know it feels that the coronavirus outbreak has set us adrift in uncharted waters, after all. Who could have known we'd be so unprepared for a pandemic? Well, some people did know, and they've provided at least a rough chart of these waters. For decades, and as recently as the end of last year, scientists warned that a flu-like pandemic was a when, not an if, scenario, for which the world was not ready. So why didn't we take it seriously enough? Well, we'll talk about that. Our habit of ignoring impending threats to humanity is not very adaptive. We haven't just ignored the threat of a viral pandemic. I mean, science has often tried to give us a heads up. For example, as early as 1945, Alexander Fleming, you know, the guy who discovered penicillin, cautioned that the overuse of antibiotics would lead to deadly resistance. And we've known for more than 50 years that the unchecked pumping of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere would lead somewhere bad. So why don't we listen to these things? Well, we have some insight because we on this show are also a little culpable. We had a kind of mental block about the idea that the coronavirus could reach across the ocean and go global, even as the outbreak was ravaging Wuhan. And that's relevant to this episode. Here's what happened. In mid-February, which now seems like a lifetime ago, we were in Seattle to record a show before an audience at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. You may have heard the other show we recorded there about artificial intelligence. Well, as we headed to Seattle, we knew that the first case of coronavirus had been detected in Washington state a few weeks prior. We wondered whether we should go, but we doubted that the virus would disrupt the meeting in Seattle or that we were in any danger. The irony is that the title of our Seattle session was, How Bad Does It Have to Get? Well, we wanted an attention-grabbing title because we were going to have a discussion about the psychology of inaction. And during the panel discussion, coronavirus was mentioned, but (laughs) only in passing. And in retrospect, that seems positively surreal. That's the background of the show you're about to hear, a discussion about science denial and societal inaction recorded just a couple weeks before the coronavirus became a frightening reality to the world outside of China. The recording was a co-presentation with the BBC World Service, and the hosts on stage were BBC reporter Roland Pease and Seth. Okay, I know. You may be saying, wait, 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 I don't want to talk about our attitude to climate change. We're busy living this scary reality of how bad does it have to get. But that's the point. We don't want to be caught again waiting until there's catastrophic damage before we act. We're learning a sobering lesson about the folly of ignoring the science. The tiny silver lining is that the coronavirus outbreak can provide instruction in how to think globally about something other than tourism and commerce. After all, following the science will help save lives. And as devastating as it is, this pandemic is not the last that we'll face. Meanwhile, climate change is still the big, shambling, living room wrecking elephant that we have stubbornly done all we can to walk around and avoid, and that will still be here when all of this is over. 
thanks for coming out to this thing. I know it's heavily advertised. We paid for the uh, Sky Riders that were sailing over <laughs> uh, Seattle yesterday advertising this session. I'm glad you actually showed up. My name is Seth. You've already heard about that. But let me introduce the dr dramatist person I, uh, today who will be talking about how bad does it have to get. Now, you know, you may be thinking that this is marriage counseling or something like that, but it's not. This is about things that scientists have warned us about. I mean, global warming is really big at this conference, but that we still don't take any action. Will we take action? Eventually, yes, if it gets really bad, but how bad does it have to get? At the table, we have Roland Pease from the BBC. For those of you who don't know, that's the Bulgarian Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Roland, you want to... Uh... Yeah, well, I, I've been covering this climate science for decades now and the climate's getting worse and worse and worse and I'm really very curious from our experts here to find out what we can do about the conversation. The next is Lee McIntyre. Tell us who you are, Lee. So uh, my name is Lee McIntyre and I'm a philosopher. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. That's good. Uh, next is Rehana Maktoufi. Ray, tell us uh, why you're here and who you are. Hi, uh, I'm Ray Hane, go by Ray. I'm a civic science fellow at NOVA PBS, uh, WGBH. I do research on science of science communication, curiosity, and how we can find mutual grounds between ourselves, scientists, and people that are skeptical about climate change, vaccination, and how we can foster empathy as scientists when we talk about different controversial science topics. All right, well, let's uh, start the conversation with you, Ray. Right now, a lot of Americans do think around 70% that climate change is happening. And they, they know that climate change is affecting people's life, right? A lot of the conversations is that we don't know what to do about it, right? We don't know what actions to take. It's, it's not something that I want to constantly be reminded about, you know, doom and gloom and things that I can't do anything about. So it's not like coronavirus that it's like everyone is so worried about it because it's happening right now. Climate change is still happening a little later. It's still something that I can't do anything about it right now. Some media is not talking about it. I mean, maybe this is the egotism of a broadcaster. Uh, to what extent are they not listening? Because we do talk about it. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good <laughs> that's question. That's the next study. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the problem, Lee? I mean, this is a, a existential problem, kind of an overworked adjective. But if people aren't talking about it, maybe they're also not doing anything about it. And why is that? Well, I think there's a relationship there. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago that Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi were sitting on the couch doing a public service ad talking about uh, fighting against climate change. But then it became politicized. And the goal of the fossil fuel community and others who were creating doubt, manufacturing doubt about this, was to run out the clock while people continued to profit and we continued to do nothing. Uh, I mean, maybe people are talking about it. You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But the problem is that there was doubt created, and then when people are just uh, stretching it out over time, uh, people get cynical. I mean, the, the way that the debate started was to say, well, climate change isn't happening. But then we quickly moved to, well, it's happening, but we don't know what's causing it. And then we eventually moved to, well, it's too late, we can't do anything about it. We've lost a lot of years for that. I get the motivation of the oil companies, I'd say. Yeah. The coal companies, they've got, they've, got, they've got a business to keep going. I don't understand what's going on with the people who listen. And when you look at them on social media, they're vehement. They're actually, they're very angry. Yeah. A lot of them don't have a dog in the game. Um, seemingly not, but uh, there's interesting that there's been some work on this to show that there are the people who create the disinformation and then there's the audience for the disinformation. Yeah. This is true on intelligent design, this is true on uh, flat earth, on climate change, uh, on any sort of science denial. And the, the, the folks who are creating the disinformation, may, maybe they do have a dog in the fight. Um, it turns out to be fairly easy to recruit people uh, over to that if there's no voice on the other side. Or, or if they, let me put it this way, if they don't trust the voices on the other side, if or if they think there's actually a genuine debate, people can get pulled over. It, it becomes a lot like team sports. Uh, you figure out, these are the people on my team, these are the people I'm going to believe. They're not necessarily looking at the evidence, they're looking at who's on their team, the person on their team, say when uh, climate change became politicized, when it became uh, you know, a conservative issue, I don't think a lot of conservatives were looking at data at that point. They were just saying, oh, that's the side I'm supposed to be on? Okay, now I'm on that side. And that's terrible. 
we're doing this from the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And that means that our audience consists of scientists or science educators or people who have a stake in science and believe in science. Now, in Holland, they have a saying, meten is weten. That means in Dutch, if you can measure something, then you know something. And it seems rather remarkable that so many people would take a position based on their political views than on measurements. I mean, if, if the National Weather Service says it's 14 degrees in Waukegan, Illinois today, uh, I think most people would believe that. But why don't they believe scientists when it comes to things like climate change? So I sometimes use the example of when I, when I was dating really horrible people, and I have this friend that I really trust, and they would come to me and be like, hey, do you remember when they said that to you and that to you? And it's all the evidence, but I'm not really listening because I really love that person, and I have a lot of personal interests in being and staying in that relationship, and I'm emotionally not ready, and my identity depends on that relationship, and I feel like if I leave that person, I would leave and lose so much of myself, then I'm, then I'm going to start saying, you know what, you don't really know him, he's also a nice person, and these are all the other great things that he's doing. I think that's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's very different from climate change, but we have so many values and beliefs that depends on me believing in climate change. Or for example, if my job is something that is providing me insurance so that I can support my family, and if I now believe in climate change and all the changes that come with it, I will lose my job, and I will lose my insurance, and I cannot support my family. So there is so many things involved in how and how it affects my self-interest that is it sometimes the you know the measurements and the data gets lost because I have so many other priorities that I'm just gonna be like no maybe there is something else. Did you eventually leave this guy? I did leave that guy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> took me a while. The, the triumph of data over <laughs> hypothesis. It uh, had to get really bad. <laughs> I, I mean, right. the question I think oh, there's a really interesting one. I, what you're saying about the political angle, and I'm finding the more and more that I go on to the social media, I'm seeing that the people are saying this is rubbish, very politically motivated. There's, um, and talk about data, obviously in Australia they've just had this extraordinary summer with the fires and on ABC they had a big discussion, Michael Mann, the climate scientist, was there explaining what is going on. They also had a, a, a liberal, which is the same as a Republican politician there, Jim Molan, and it's really interesting when the host started to press him on this. We've got this clip to play to you. Look, Australia, this is a message to the rest of the world. Climate change has arrived. Dangerous climate change has arrived now. How bad are we willing to let it get? Jim Mullins, do you accept that scientific view? I certainly accept that the, the climate is changing. It has changed and it will change. And what it's producing is hotter and drier weather and a hotter and drier uh, com uh, country. And, and what's causing that? Uh, as to whether it is... Uh, human-induced climate change is... Thank you, thank you. As to whether it is human-induced climate change, my mind is open. But uh, every day across my desk comes enough information for me to say that there are other opinions. So, so what, what is that information? Oh, it's, a, it's a range of information which goes... <laughs> it's, it's a range of... Thank you. But, but, sorry, it's, could we it's, just it's, respectfully listen to this? Yeah, minute? thank I'm you. Just try to get to the bottom of this. What is what is the evidence that you are relying I'm on? I'm not relying on evidence, Hamish. I am saying. <laughs> but, but you said it. But but this is this is why my mind is open. I would love to be convinced one way or the other. What you didn't hear was Michael Mann's comeback. It's good to have an open mind, but not so open your brain falls out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lee, come on. There's nothing new here in some sense. Right? If we were having this discussion a thousand years ago, aside from the differing dress of the participants, you know, people would say, if it isn't in the Bible, it's not true. Right? And that was, that's what they believed. And I'm sure that any polls taken by Ray or anybody else would show the majority of people don't believe, for example, things related to astronomy or Earth's importance in the cosmos. So is there something, I mean, it's just human nature? Can we expect this? Science denial has been around as long as science. Uh, that, that's clear if you, you look back at uh, Giordano Bruno or Galileo, Darwin, I mean, this, yes. But there's something new today. And what's new today is that uh, these fringe opinions that people have can get amplified on social media 
and they, they become viral. I, I remember when I was a kid being uh, absolutely flummoxed by the idea that there were people who believed that we hadn't been to the moon because I saw it on TV. And I remember asking my mom, uh, how could there be people who didn't believe that we'd been to, to the moon? And she said, uh, you know, I don't know. So they were out there, but you'd never met one. Well, you know what? Now you've met them. And you've met them because they radicalize one another on social media. They have meetups and they recruit new members. And then once it looks like there's a controversy over something like this, then the media reports it as a controversy. People wonder, you know, is there really some doubt? Maybe not over the moon landing, but I think that's exactly what's happened with uh, Flat Earth, which has had a, a huge rise uh, recently, because all of us, I mean, there's something that you wouldn't expect in the 21st century, but here we are. Is that just because of social media that these people with the radical ideas now have a platform? They find sympathetic people among the audience? I, I think that it's partially the um, uh, partisanship issue, whether, whether you want to think of that in the political context or some other context where people are choosing up sides. But the other is the ability to get disinformation out there uh, much more quickly. Um, a lot of science deniers are radicalized based on YouTube videos. I mean, that just was not possible 20 years ago. But now people who maybe bring their curiosity about science to the internet, they're finding some really weird stuff. Good conversation, Seth. It sounds like in summary, a pithy summary, is denial is a powerful psychological force. Yeah, well, that's understandable, too, because clearly, from an evolutionary point of view, being wired to worry about something that's very slow moving that might occur over, you know, the next 50 years or 100 years, I mean, you, you, you're not wired to, to, to worry about that. And beyond that, through most of our history, you wouldn't ever have known about it. It would just have occurred. So uh, I'm not surprised people don't get excited about it. Also, it was interesting what Ray said that while coronavirus is happening right now, climate change still feels like it's a long ways away. But of course, it's not. Climate change is unfolding now. We're seeing the effects now. And yet preparedness is still meeting with resistance. Yeah. I think it's uh, pretty much like saving for your retirement. It seems so far away, it's hard to get you motivated. Next, ideas for addressing science denial and inaction as Seth and I come to you from our homes where we're sheltering in place. More from a discussion recorded in February 2020, How Bad Does It Have to Get? on Big Picture Science. We continue our discussion about science denial in the face of impending threats, and we'll also explore some possible solutions. You know, Molly, maybe this is simply a consequence of limited imagination. Just a couple of weeks ago, we couldn't really imagine being stuck in our homes for weeks with a tidal wave of illness threatening us. Well, that's right. And as we try to connect the threat of climate change with the pandemic, you know, I read where a climate scientist called coronavirus climate change at warp speed. So when it comes to climate change, not only are we being asked to imagine the most devastating effects, we're being asked to act aggressively to avoid them now. Individually, most of us couldn't imagine what aggressive immediate action really looked like before today. Clearly, science can tell us of the dangers, but it's not very good at making us feel the weight of those dangers, at understanding them at a, at a gut emotional level so that we do take action. Is there a role there for scientists? Now, I don't know, but how to take the issues to heart is what our guests discussed next. We continue our conversation that was recorded at the AAAS meeting in Seattle in February, about two weeks before the coronavirus outbreak went global. On stage with Seth is BBC reporter Roland Pease 
and the guest, philosopher and historian of science Lee McIntyre, and civic science fellow at NOVA PBS, Rayana Maktoufi. We turn to the subject of solutions. How do you fight this? I mean, you all are very much aware, when I say you all, I'm referring to the live audience here, which is uh, mostly somnolent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> referring to the live audience here, you're all aware of this problem. There are a lot of sessions here at the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science dealing with climate change. We're trying to deal with how do you change people's minds? Giving them more facts, is that the way to go? Facts can change people's mind, but it has to be done within a particular context. The uh, work that I'm doing right now uh, is based on uh, engagement. If people don't believe in evidence, you're not going to convince them with more evidence. What you do is you build trust. You engage with them one-on-one. -on -one, and then when people begin to trust you, then you can build in evidence. I'll give you an example. Uh, Jim Bridenstine was a, a rock rib Republican uh, person in Congress who gave a speech on the, the floor of Congress uh, against climate change. So of course, President Trump appointed him to be the head of NASA. Once he became the head of NASA, he changed his mind on climate change within a few months. And the question is why? And he, I mean, he came out publicly to say that he was wrong because he started to get to know the scientists. All of a sudden, these people, that he was their boss, um, he got to know them. He saw them in the hallway. He had lunch with them. People change their mind based on trusting relationships, which is why the worst advice possible is don't talk about religion and politics over Thanksgiving dinner. That's exactly where we should talk about it. That's, that's how you change people's minds. Ray, you've been really nodding there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, I think it's all about finding, because there has been this deficit model of science communication where we have thought for the longest time that, oh, give people the facts, they will know what the deal with climate change is, and everything would be great. And then we did it, and then it wasn't great. And it's exactly what Lee is saying. It's, it's not just the facts. You have to build a relationship. You have to build trust. You have to find mutual grounds. If you're not a religious person, don't try to start talking to someone about religion and science. Find someone that is a religious person person and they can talk about religion and science. If you have both children, talk about how climate change relates to your children. Talk about that thing that you both have in common and try to build those connections. And I think the most important thing is to realize changing mind, changing attitudes, changing behavior is not going to happen in this one conversation that you're having with someone. It's probably also not going to be you. It's going to be you starting a conversation and just a conversation. And the next person is going to also have a next nice conversation with them. And the next scientist is going to have that. And eventually, with this building of trust, maybe at some point they will be like, you know what, I'm getting to know them. And maybe they're not all horrible people. And maybe they don't have all self-interest in corporations or anything. Maybe it is about humanity. All right, we're going to go to the audience here and uh, take your questions. Uh, yes? Yeah, how, how can we harness the fact that everybody likes storytelling? Um, so, so I think you're also referring to Dr. Nabi's work about emotions. So th there's different research on, OK, so what if I just like have fear in my messages that climate change is happening, we're all dying, and everything is going to be doomed, right? And that brings a lot of inaction. So if you actually want people to do something and have actionable items and, and have change in behavior, you have to bring the message of hope. You have to tell them how the things that they're doing can have a better effect yes. and can change minds. And one of the reasons that storytelling and narratives work so much is because they also probably have a lot of emotions embedded in them and elicit a lot of emotions. And I think something that a lot of um, people that talk about climate change or vaccination uh, have a lot of strong emotions too, especially of fear that causes the inaction. Um, so how can we ha bring that message of hope in our stories? I mean, uh, you talk about hope, and I do wonder with, because I, I suspect there's something a bit different with anti-vaxxers, with flat earthers and so on. Um, and in the case of climate, I do wonder whether powerlessness has something to do with it. You know, yeah, there is something going on, but I, I can't do it. Yeah, I, I think a big part of it is that, yeah, that people feel like, okay, it's so big, I don't know what I can do, what's my role? I think it's important to point out to people, as you would in any crisis, uh, when somebody's having a heart attack, you don't just say, somebody call an ambulance. You say, you call an ambulance. You start CPR. You do this and that. So I think giving people specifics of what they can do to fight climate change helps. Uh, I was uh, interested to find out, uh, just in, in my own research, that one of the main things you can do to fight climate change is to stop eating meat. 
and that one of the greatest uh, resources for our carbon capture is to plant trees. Things like this, I think very specific, concrete, practical things uh, can help people to see what they themselves can do. There's one which I think is very interesting. I think that the mood has changed enormously, and it's only mood in the past year or so. You've had the school strikes, Greta Thunberg and so on. Molly Bentley, the producer, went to see the Extinction Rebellion XR people who have done the action, taking on the, uh, the authorities, taking this to the street. And I think they've really changed the mood. I'm Michael Foster, and I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion Seattle. Hi, I'm John Beto, and I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion Seattle. The climate disaster is unfolding before us, and the time to act is now, or we are looking at a massive extinction. I'm seeing billions of creatures dying, and I'm refusing to look away from that. Now, Extinction Rebellion, for some, is considered a radical group. Do you think that your willingness to be extreme in some of your demands, your outspokenness, um, the protests, willing to get arrested, may turn some people away from your movement and what you're asking for? Some people will be polarized away from our goals if we are breaking rules. And yet, there will be another group of people, a subset, who are aware that this is the right side of history and I have to change. So that's the dilemma of taking uh, any kind of disobedient action is that you have to make your point very clearly. Your action has to speak louder than your words. I'm right now fasting. I've been fasting since the first day of the legislative session in Washington State, asking Governor Inslee, who ran on climate, to hold a citizens' assembly. I break fast at night, I will go on hunger strike and stop eating altogether if he hasn't done this by the end of this session in another month. We have to rebel if we are going to keep anything alive. 25% of species might go extinct or 95% of species. It's up to you and me. I mean, what really interests me about that clip is, one, it takes on your idea about uh, taking power, to have being bearing yeah. witness, but it also, I think, takes on what the lady was there saying. It's, it's telling a story. It's generating a story. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, uh, one, one of the most important things is to emphasize that we're already in a climate emergency, that this is not something that's going to happen someday. We're already seeing uh, the effects. And uh, I think it's important for, uh, for folks to realize when they look at extreme weather events, to look at the fires that happen in Australia, to you know, take it home. Yes, this is exactly what, uh, what climate change looks like. And it's, I don't think it's a bad thing to um, you know, talk about the long-term consequences of things like that. Some people think of that as scare tactics. But you know, if you look at the models, they, they are actually quite scary. Well, the title of this session is How Bad Does It Have to Get? And Lee, uh, I, I... I'm generalizing here, but America tends to wait until something is really, really bad before they do anything about it. And that's maybe because the country is big, problems always seem far away, they're affecting all those people over there, but not me. Uh, How do you deal with that? I mean, the fact that unless it gets to this critical level, and I don't know where that is when it comes to climate change, they don't feel compelled to do anything. Well, I think the question again is uh, what can they do? Um, And if you look for the you know, the decision makers, the people in power to actually do something, they're in Washington. And, you know, where are their interests? Their interests are in re-election. So, I mean, that's something that we can do. We can make sure that we vote uh, and that we let people know that we're voting. I think that if we could get more people um, not afraid to talk to their neighbors about it, I mean, that influences how people vote. Should we go to another question? I'm just wondering, is there any data about how much overlap there is among the various groups of science deniers, the climate change and the anti-vaxxers and the flat earth people? It's been shown that people who are more likely to believe in one conspiracy theory, more likely to believe in another one. You you definitely find this. And and belief in conspiracy theories is one of the five tropes of uh, of science deniers. So So you do find correlations here. But it doesn't always match exactly what you would think. For instance, um, two years ago, I went to the Flat Earth International Conference, and I fully expected that they would be climate change deniers, but they were not. 
And the reason why was interesting. It was because they believed that there was a dome over the earth. So we basically live in a terrarium and we have to take care of what's happening inside the terrarium. So odd, unexpected. But they were not science deniers about climate change, but they were about the flatness of the earth. I mean, there was a very interesting session here at the AAAS about uh, skepticism, about uh, trust in scientists. One of the people in the audience said, but we're telling uh, scientists to be skeptical about each other's work. So actually, in a way, the right kind of skepticism for the rest of the public is, should be encouraged. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think skepticism, curiosity, questioning, the, conversation the, should be encouraged. But those sorts of things are used as a cudgel against science. Yes. Right? Yeah. Look, the scientists were wrong about this. Yeah. Consequently, you should believe that they're wrong about whatever it is that I'm arguing about. People don't know what skepticism means. They hear that scientists are skeptics and they think, oh, well, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I'm skeptical. Not the same thing. Skepticism means that you're withholding your belief in the face of insufficient evidence. But once the sufficient evidence is there, once the warrant is there, it's perfectly OK to give your cognitive consent. That's the piece that uh, science deniers, conspiracy theorists don't seem to understand. They think that unless you can prove something 100%, you shouldn't believe it. And that is a ridiculous standard for any sort of belief. There's something in Naomi Oreskes' book, Merchants of Doubt, that reflects yes. what you've just said, what Seth was saying, that it's not a question of saying, here's a different science. All they have to do is to unpick little bits of the established science, introduce that element of doubt. And that's, that's right. the sort of the hook that gets people into denialism. Also the uh, tendency for scientists to use the word theory, which is misunderstood by a large fraction of the population. Let's have another question. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about worldviews in conspiracy theories and trying to combat this misinformation. Because from what I understand, um, this relates a lot to the inability to remove that um, those beliefs. What, what those beliefs are embedded in, the bigger picture. How these doubts, how these uh, theories relate to people's bigger world views. So I guess yeah. that includes religion, but right. not only religion. Well, well, so, some, sometimes that's the case. I mean, a lot of times, if you, if you look at how humans form beliefs, it's based on identity. And I mean, it's been that way for a, for a long time. So if we have uh, ideological views or faith views, you know, other sorts of views, th that can go a long way toward telling us what, what we want to believe. And the interesting thing for me as a philosopher, you know, studying how people reason about science, is that if people are motivated not to believe something, they, they will find a reason not to believe it. I think it was Upton Sinclair who said, it's very hard to get a man to believe something when his salary depends on him not believing it. And people are that way about everything. If they, if they don't want to believe something, they will find every excuse not to do it. So there, there is this way that it's embedded, which is why, as I was saying before, it's important to engage people, find out the other things that they care about when you're trying to get them to change their beliefs. Scientists do a lot better than journalists, I'm afraid, which is sad for me. And we are the, the interlocutors often in, in all of this. The scientists don't do a good job of communicating it, so they're relying on us, and people don't trust us. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... <laughs> yeah, the journalists, unfortunately, and the media is not very high on the trust level. And I think something that matters a lot is how can media also be more engaged in communities, figure out what is something that the communities care more about, how to phrase information so that it reflects what people... Um, it's, it reflects people's self-interest. It comes back to the storytelling. It definitely comes back to the storytelling. But also, there's, it's, it might be very hard, because sometimes if you're associated to a certain channel, there's already certain pre-assumptions about you, and that would determine, you know, how people might perceive you no matter what they say sometimes. More discussion to come from our show recorded before an audience in Seattle. How bad does it have to get on Big Picture Science? We continue with the final part of a discussion we recorded earlier this year about why we have a not very adaptive habit of ignoring the science about large impending threats. Climate change was the main topic we discussed that day, not pandemics, because at that time, the coronavirus outbreak was primarily in China. And as we've said, 
even we had something to learn about how to imagine the unimaginable. But the threat of pandemics has fueled the work of virologists, animal disease experts, the CDC and the WHO for decades, certainly since the deadly 1918 flu circled the globe. Scientists have been using models to play out what would happen in the situation we face today, the introduction of a novel virus to which we have no immunity. And they've been informing governments of their finding. We've heard how psychology plays a role in keeping us from taking action about what seem like far-off threats. Well, politics is in the mix, too. A recently released report from the Department of Health and Human Services shows that just months before the coronavirus began circulating, the Trump administration ran an experiment with states, federal agencies, and hospitals to test the country's pandemic preparedness. The simulation was called Crimson Contagion, and it modeled what would happen after infected tourists bring the virus to Chicago. The hypothetical outbreak revealed the widespread unpreparedness of the country to face a pandemic, but the results were largely ignored and kept confidential until now. So our guests on stage with Seth in February, BBC reporter Roland Pease, Lee McIntyre, and Rihanna McTufi, couldn't talk about the Crimson Contagion model, but they did discuss how politics plays a role in muting scientific findings and dissuading societies from taking action based on them. I'd, I'd like to bring up a, another topic, uh, slightly different, but maybe not. And that is, are we really in a post-truth era now? Uh, is there something new? I mean, is a post-truth era really new? Or has the post-truth era, you know, been the last 300,000 years, the existence time of Homo sapiens? So you're looking at me because I wrote a book called Post-Truth. <laughs> And it has become fashionable in the last um, year for there to be a backlash against the idea that we're in the, in the post-truth era. And, I, and I'm defending the idea that we are, but it depends on what you mean by it. When I say that we're in the post-truth era, what I mean is that uh, I take post-truth to be a, a tactic uh, for the political subordination of reality. It's a tactic that uh, authoritarians and authoritarian wannabes use to get control of the information stream so that they can make people cynical about what's actually true and what's not, because they're, then it's easier to take over and to, to rule those people. So in that sense, I'm very uh, worried about it. Now, other people have made the claim, uh, famously uh, Steven Pinker and folks like this, that no, we're, we couldn't possibly be in a post-truth era because too many people still care about truth. And I'm not saying that people don't care about truth. I'm simply saying that truth is, uh, is now in danger, which I think needs to be acknowledged. Maybe you could give a couple of uh, concrete examples of how this post-truth yeah. era works in terms of convincing people to believe something that the facts well, don't support. So I, I can give it the easiest one is one that has to do with science that occurred just a few months ago. When Trump had that uh, a map from the NOAA for Hurricane Dorian, and he drew with the Sharpie. And I mean, we're all laughing because it is absolutely ridiculous. But do you understand how successful that was? How many people he actually convinced that Alabama was in danger? If you did a poll on this now, uh, I'll bet it would be 35 to 40 percent, and we know who they are, uh, would believe that uh, Alabama had been in danger. The problem is that when, when politicians lie and they're not accountable for the lie, that's when the truth is in danger. And when I say that we're in a post-truth era, I don't mean that we don't care about truth. I mean that when people violate the norms of truth, they get reelected. They don't pay a political price for it. That's the danger. I have a problem, which is I try to avoid the word truth when it comes to science. I don't think scientists, personally, I don't think scientists deal in truth. They just try and do a better description today of the world than we had yesterday. And one of the problems is that people expect truth from scientists and they cannot deliver it. And it seems to me that's actually somewhere in that, that nexus of the problem. Yeah, communicating that science is uncertainty, we always talk about, we never say anything is 100% true. We always say, with this level of certainty, I can say something about what I found. And learning how to talk about the uncertainty in science is also an important part of you know, getting people on board with science, that when I say, 
I'm not a hundred percent for sure, for sure, for real. Believe like believing that this is how things work. That doesn't mean that anything, like the other thing, is true. That the other there is so much space for the other thing. But that this is the best explanation that we have, and here's how we got there. Which is why I think it's very important that while we talk about facts and we talk about emotions and trust, we also talk about how the scientific process works and have more on sci scientific evidence and processes and how we do research as well should be a part of what we talk about. I, I think that's right because sci I think that science denial is not just a denial of scientific facts. It's a denial of the process by which we come up with uh, uh, good data. We, we come up with evidence. We come up with uh, truth, if you want to think of it that way. And people don't really understand that uncertainty is a strength of science. It's not a weakness. When we put error bars on things, that's a good thing. And I think that there's a way to tell a story about what science does that can help people to understand that. Um, a few months ago, Reuters uh, did a story where they talked about the fact that the, uh, uh, the evidence in favor of anthropogenic climate change was now so strong that there was only a one out of a million chance that the uh, science deniers were right. One out of a million. And I don't know if, if anybody remembers the, the movie Dumb and Dumber when uh, uh, Jim Carrey is asking, you know, what are the chances you'd go out with a guy like me? And she says, one in a million. And he says, so you're telling me there's a chance. You don't want to be that guy. I mean, to insist on certainty, to insist on proof, is ridiculous, and we've got to stop allowing science deniers to use that as a cudgel against science. We've got to make it clear that you don't want to be the guy who says, so you're telling me there's a chance. Hi, yeah, I'd like to ask another uh, topic here, because when the Pew Initiative did the gap between science and AAAS scientists, the biggest gap in terms of where science was versus the general public was the safety of GM foods. Um, and I haven't heard that discussed much. It's even bigger than the climate change gap. Um, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Yes, I, I know that study, and it actually is a, a larger gap. And this is where I begin to wonder whether or not it's true that all science denial is, uh, is partisan. Because uh, if you look at climate change, if you look at um, pushback against uh, Darwin, that can be fairly partisan. Uh, you look at anti-vax, it's partisan, but a little more bipartisan. But GM foods, uh, GMOs, that's uh, one that I think might uh, swing a little bit more left. And this gets people in trouble every time they, uh, they bring it up. The standards are different in Europe. But if you're just looking at the numbers and you're looking at the, uh, again, at the, at the polling data between what scientists think and what the public thinks, there is a, a, an enormous gap there. I mean, is this idea that is science belief or disbelief is partisan really a, maybe a red herring? Because after the war, Science could do no wrong. And the Republican Party, in particular, was a strong supporter of basic research. And we need to defend basic science. And remember, Nixon brought in the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. So, again, another example. I mean, but it is interesting, I think, the GMO, because I, I think that's a left-wing identity issue. And that's about corporations. So, again, I think it comes back to the people feeling they don't have power because they're being dictated to by corporations, they're being dictated to by scientists whose language they don't understand. And it comes back to trying to get that empathy. Of course, we like to say in science that science is self-correcting, right? That eventually the truth will out, right? And I, I have no doubt that that's, that's going to be the case for climate change. What we're trying to decide here is at what point does it out? Sadly, I know how bad it can get. And that is that we've only got four minutes till the end of this show. <laughs> so. If we can come back, uh, uh, even if it's the right question, how bad can it get? Is that the right question, and how, or how to, bad does it need to be for us to pay attention? Uh, right. So the way I think about it is, no matter how bad it's going to get before something needs to happen from the decision maker, as scientists, when we set up that feeling of like, oh, I need to persuade right now, because like, you know, something is horrible is happening right now. We have to set up that mindset of 
no matter what, I need to spend this time to build connections. I need to spend this time to have conversations, to go to my communities, to know my audience, to build strategies, and eventually to go through the process of trust building so that maybe eventually people would start having more cognitive engagement with the topic, think more about it, be a part of this decision making, and eventually if they would do something about it. Yeah, um, it, it seems to me that uh the internet isn't going anywhere. Cognitive bias isn't going anywhere. And so we need to figure out what to do. And I think the thing that we can do, as you said, is uh, start to talk to one another. And these conversations uh, are where we share evidence. And I think we need to also remember that there is a lot of ignorance out there and that people will fill in. Uh, you know, you, you very rarely hear people say, well, I don't have any data on that, so I don't have any beliefs. They have beliefs. Their emotions or cognitive bias provides the beliefs. The, the latest example that I laughed at in the GMO debate is when I read about a uh, survey, and I wish I could remember the, the number, but uh, an appallingly high number of people uh, reacted to a dummy poll question asking uh, how many people thought that there should be mandatory labeling of all foods that contained DNA, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, and I mean, it was, and I wish I could remember the exact number. But, it, but it, was, it was a very high number. So, I mean, that just shows you that people need to have these conversations to learn the basic facts of science. All right, let, let, let's finish up here. We gotta, we've got to finish up. The question was, how bad does it have to get? Can I get one sentence from each of our guests? Uh, give me an example of something that would be bad enough to uh, change the situation. Can you do that? I, I'm not sure I can do that. I, I th it's, it's already pretty bad. <laughs> I, I can. Oh. I can. I think. California burning the way it has for the past two years, Australia burning the way it has, the floods that we've had around the world, we already know how bad it is, but we have to get everyone else to listen. So how bad it has to get is today. Ray? It's so hard for me to answer that because I feel like sometimes it could get as bad as it gets and sometimes someone might say, oh, it might be another reason. It might be something else. I can't do anything about it. Someone else could. That's why it's a tricky question for me to answer. <laughs> uh, all, right, all right. Okay, I want to thank our audience here at the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science in lovely Seattle, Washington. And uh, the weather outside is not as bad as it can get here. And let me thank our guests. <laughs> Ray McToofy and Lee McIntyre for being here and uh, you know, seeing how bad it could get right up here in front of the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Be sure to listen to Science in Action, the BBC, and Big Picture Science. You can find both online. Thank you very much for coming. Again, thanks to our guests who joined us for this discussion, reporter Roland Pease, host of BBC's Science in Action, Rayana McTufi, a civic science fellow at NOVA PBS at WGBH, and Lee McIntyre, philosopher and research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, and the author of The Scientific Attitude and Post-Truth. Well, Seth, what's the big picture of what we heard in this show of why we're not willing to take action, even when science warns us of impending threats. Yeah, well, it kind of sounds like we're kind of wired not to take action. I mean, the, the point was made several times that telling people the facts of a threat, just that isn't good enough. That isn't likely to persuade them. What will persuade them is to have the facts or at least the situation explained to them by their peers, by people they interact with frequently and whose values they share. So the question is, are we going to be better in our response to climate change after this experience with coronavirus? Well, I would hope so, but you know, I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. One thing that does strike me is that at least for America, we are usually pretty bad about dealing with the long-term effects of anything. I mean, look at corporations who are worried about next quarter's bottom line and not giving too much consideration to something that may happen to them five years down the road. I mean, that's just the way we seem to be. But again, we ourselves didn't take this to heart when we went to Seattle in February, when we were cautious, but not really worried that coronavirus posed a threat. Here's our coda. Days after we returned from the meeting, scientists announced their surprising discovery that coronavirus had probably been spreading in the county that includes Seattle 
for four to six weeks, including while we were there. A final thought. There's a lot of misinformation out there about this coronavirus outbreak, including pseudoscience remedies and false statements about how the virus operates and how you can test yourself without the benefit of a lab and that sort of thing. If it sounds incredible, it probably is. Check the facts with reputable scientific sources like your local public health service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. Follow the science. We couldn't do this show without senior producer Gary Niederhoff and assistant producer Sarah Derwin. Thank you to them for helping us record the show in Seattle and for continuing to work on the show from their homes. I'm executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute a nonprofit education and research organization that investigates, among other things, the longevity of civilizations. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak. Also, a big thanks to our listeners. This episode of Big Picture Science, How Bad Does It Have to Get?, was recorded in Seattle at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in February 2020. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to the guests you heard. Stay safe, everyone.